<laughs> it was you who told Wynn to kill me. Guilty as charged. <laughs> Why are you <laughs> The 90s were an interesting time for superhero movies. It gave us gems like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Darkman, The Crow, Tim Burton's Batman, and Blade. Nestled between the releases of Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin and Steel starring Shaquille O'Neal, an adaptation arrived that has since drifted to obscurity. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film and Comics Explained, and as requested, today we're exploring Spawn. What would you do if at the moment of death, a voice from the darkness offered you the chance to live again? Have your answer? I'm Todd McFarlane, and I created Spawn. Created by Todd McFarlane and released in May of 1992 by Image Comics, Al Simmons, aka Spawn, is a dark hero with a complicated past. In his 30 year run, making Spawn the longest running indie comic of all time, his character and abilities have grown across 300 mainline issues, several spin offs, and appearances in various comics and other media. The first few issues introduce us to the character of Al Simmons, a devoted family man, decorated marine, and CIA operative recruited by the US security group. Created and run by the sinister Jason Wynn, unbeknownst to Simmons, the group had ties to organized crime entities. The unit would complete top secret missions under the guise of national security, many of which crossed ethical lines. Al becomes increasingly distressed about the morality of the task he's asked to carry out, and ultimately reaches a breaking point, requesting to be let go from the agency. Wynn agrees while secretly hiring Al's friend Bruce Dinson to murder him on his last stop, sending his soul to hell for the things he'd done. Arranging a deal with Malabolgia, a being from the Eighth Circle of Hell that has been forming an army for his war against God, Simmons agrees to become a Hellspawn in exchange for being allowed to see his wife, Wanda Blake. Malabolgia grants his wish and returns him to Earth with little memory, a badly disfigured body, mysterious powers, and a handler named the Violator to watch over him. Owl, now known as Spawn, realizes that five years have passed and discovers that Wanda had married his best friend Terry and that the two have a daughter. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! The successive issues covered the growth of his abilities and his ascension into a crime-fighting anti-hero that struck fear into the hearts of criminals. Due to his augmented demon physiology, his body is quite dense, weighing over 450 pounds, and is composed entirely of necroplasm, giving Spawn superhuman strength, speed, and durability, in addition to a number of unique abilities which we're about to explore. Aiding his crime fighting and infiltration are skills gained in his previous life, including his mastery of over 13 different forms of martial arts and the ability to speak more than 10 languages. Spawn wears a living symbiotic cloak known as the Lethra of the Seventh House of K, essentially a sentient and constantly evolving neural parasite bonded to his nervous system that protects him. Kind of like Doctor Strange's cloak of levitation, if the cloak could evolve into a stronger and more effective form over time. Using it, he can shapeshift, glide, manifest spikes, armor plating, and other weaponry.
Despite having vast magical abilities, due to his limited power supply and the fact that using it all up would condemn Spawn to eternal torment in hell, he relies heavily on the cloak in combat. However, it should be noted that although his power source is finite, what he can do with it is amazing, with his biggest limitation being imagination. Throughout his publication history, Spawn has accomplished tremendous feats from resurrecting the dead, firing blasts of necroplasmic energy, teleportation, flame breathing, transmutation, manipulation of the elements, shapeshifting, flight, invisibility, time manipulation, soul manipulation, reality warping, regeneration, telekinesis, cosmic awareness, talking to animals, reading minds, feeding off sins and negative energy to augment his strength, to curing the sick, just to name a few. He's also later revealed to contain up to 6,000 lost souls within him, known as Legion, that he could summon to help him in combat, though their numbers would diminish over time. Interestingly, the Keeper would bestow him with the ability to sense misery, pain, and hatred as both a gift and punishment. He is thus always aware when someone is attacked or murdered, forcing him to experience the anguish of all humanity. The film condenses his early comic book run into 96 minutes of action, opening with a voiceover by Nicole Williamson's Cogliostro, detailing the endless struggle between the forces of heaven and hell. All Malbolgia needs now is a great soldier, someone to lead his horde to the gates of heaven and burn them down. We're then introduced to our kick-ass protagonist, played by martial arts legend Michael J. White, completing a political assassination in Hong Kong on behalf of his employer, Martin Sheen's Jason Wynn. Behind the shadows, Wynn and the Violator, in his show-stealing performance from John Leguizamo, are plotting against Simmons. We need you to help recruit a very special soldier for us, your all-time favorite killer, Al Simmons. Furious about the continuous civilian deaths incurred on their missions due to bad intel and the overwhelming belief that they were doing the wrong thing, Al demands to be transferred out. Wynn agrees to let him go after a final mission to destroy a North Korean biochemical plant, where Al is betrayed and killed by another of Wynn's assassins, Jessica Priest, in a slight deviation from the comics. Waking up in hell, he's offered up a Faustian deal by Frank Welker's Malibolgia. He can return to Earth and see his fiancée again, but must become Malibolgia's eternal servant and the leader of his army in Armageddon in return. Unfortunately, when he does come back, he discovers that five years have passed and that Wanda is now happily remarried to his best friend Terry. That right there is emotional damage. After encountering the Violator, his new role is explained to him. I want you to take care of Wynn, and then you and the army can kick some angelic buttocks. And in return for your services, we'll get Wanda back for you. Not only is Jason Wynn continued to get away with crimes against humanity, but is now dabbling as a weapons dealer and has developed the ultimate biological weapon called Heat-16. Heat-16. <laughs> Makes the Ebola virus look like a skin rash. During one of Wynn's lavish receptions, Simmons attacks his former boss and gets revenge on Jessica before escaping. The Violator then convinces Wynn to set up a dead man's switch that would trigger the worldwide release of Heat-16 should his vital signs flatline. Wynn is told that the device is a safeguard against an assassination attempt, but in truth, Malibolgia wants Spawn to kill him and trigger his coveted apocalypse. Discovering that Terry and a reporter were about to expose his crimes, Jason destroys Terry's computer and takes the family hostage. After some help from Cogliostro, a former Hellspawn that teaches him to harness the true potential of his powers, Spawn arrives and extracts the device from his body, foiling his plans. Drawn back to Hell, he defiantly tells Malibolgia that he will never lead his army before defeating the Violator. The film ends with the arrest of Wynn and Spawn essentially realizing that he must move on from his former life and now dedicate himself to justice rather than vengeance. It has a more intelligent, sophisticated sense about it. Given that it's still a guy in a costume with superpowers, it's really more sci-fi-ish instead of comic bookish. Columbia Pictures had initially approached Todd McFarlane about a Spawn movie in 1992, but realizing that he wouldn't be allowed much creative input, he declined. He would sell the rights a few years later to New Line Cinema for a very low price, with an agreement that he would have creative input and the retention of all the merchandising rights, a move out of the George Lucas playbook. A new production company called Pull Down Your Pants Pictures, made up of former employees of Industrial Light and Magic, would helm the project. Mark Dipp was charged with directing the film, while Clint Goldman and Steve Williams took the roles of second unit director and visual effects supervisor respectively. 
Uh, I met Todd McFarlane, this maybe three and a half years ago, and he was very interested in making a film based on his character. As soon as I read the first few books, I saw the potential of the character. What started as a $20 million project ballooned into $45 million, with the crew shooting over five times the number of visual effects shots that were initially slated. ILM ended up doing the majority of the special effects, along with 22 companies around the world that worked on the nearly year-long task of creating the visuals. Admittedly, despite all that work, 25 years later, some of the effects are hilariously bad. This is the bargain. But it should be noted that, in addition to CGI, the film did make use of many practical effects. Both Michael J. White and John Leguizamo have stated that they lamented each morning as their makeup and prosthetics took between four to eight hours to apply, depending on the shot. Oh, it almost makes you go crazy. Give me that paintbrush. I want to stab your eyeball, too. <laughs> I had blisters on the back. I got more blisters on the back of my neck. I just felt them. I'm like a Picasso <laughs> The film hit theaters August 1st, 1997, and despite competing with blockbusters like Men in Black and Air Force One, it opened second at the box office and quickly made back its bloated budget. Unfortunately, it suffered from less than positive jabroni reviews, calling the film difficult to follow and over-reliant on special effects. I was privy to the first cut. There was so much editing and so many changes, and the story elements just suffered. Admittedly, Spawn's suit springing out of his body and slapping into place doesn't look nearly as good now, but the silliness of front flipping off a high balcony, firing dual-wielded machine guns and a glorious spiral of bullets always puts a smile on my face. But with that said, of course, I'd love to hear what you guys thought about the movie, so please share that in the comments below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, come join our regular streams on Twitch, and uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.